Keith. Oh! Hi. You caught me singing about going live. And that's what I've done. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is John. And this is part four of C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Yay. Right. So, let's, uh, let's catch you up to speed. Where have we just got to? The four Pevensies have just entered Narnia. And um, they've just been wandering around. They got a little bit lost. And so um, Edmund and Peter have just been having a little conversation about how they're lost. And they don't know how to get home. And they don't know what they're going to have for dindins. Which is not good. And so we're going to carry on from there. Now, I am going to do some accents today. I'm going to give some accents a go. So if they sound terrible, then I apologise. But, you know, that's just the way the cookie crumbles. Hello, Peter. Hi. My faithful listener, Peter, has been here every single day for this. And he says that he's going to watch this film after this. So um, hopefully I'll do it justice. Hopefully I'll do a C.S. Lewis justice as well. Oh, and Peter, you just missed it. I'm going to do some accents. So don't judge me. Right, here we go. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Chapter 7. A Day with the Beavers. Great Scott, said Peter. I hadn't thought of that. And no chance of dinner either, said Edmund. While the two boys were whispering behind, both the girls suddenly cried. Oh! And stopped. The robin, cried Lucy. The robin! It's flown away! And so it had, right out of sight. Ah, oh, and now what are we to do, said Edmund, giving Peter a look, which was as much to say, What did I tell you? Shh, look, said Susan. What, said Peter. There's something moving amongst the trees over there to the left. They all stared as hard as they could, and no one felt very comfortable. There it goes again, said Susan presently. My, I saw it that time too, said Peter. It's still there. It's just, it's gone behind that big tree. What is it? said Lucy, trying hard, very not to sound nervous. Whatever it is, said Peter, it's dodging us. It's something that doesn't want to be seen. Let's go home, said Susan, and then... Though nobody said it out loud, everyone suddenly realised the same fact that Edmund had whispered to Peter at the end of the last chapter. They were lost! What's it like? said Lucy. It's... it's a kind of animal, said Susan. And then, look, look, quick, there it is! They all saw it this time. A whiskered furry face, just like mine, you see? Uh, we're in lockdown, so I'm trying to grow a beard. Anyway, sorry. A whiskered furry face which had looked out at them from behind a tree, but this time it didn't immediately draw back. Instead, the animal put its paw against its mouth. Just as humans do when they put their finger on, on their lips, when they're signalling to you to be quiet. Then it disappeared again. The children all stood, holding their breath. Here we go. Wait, here, there's a picture. What is this whiskered, furry-faced animal? Actually, the title of the chapter gave it away. But never mind. A moment later, the strange creature, sorry, the stranger, came out from behind the tree, glanced all around, as if it were afraid something was still watching, said, Hush! Made signs to them to join it in the thicket, of, thicket thicker bit of the wood where it was standing, and then once more it disappeared. I know what it is, said Peter. It's a beaver! I saw the tail. It wants us to go with it, said Susan. And it is warning us not to make a noise. Uh, I know, said Peter. The question is, are we to go with it or not? Uh, what do you think, Lou? Uh, I think it's a nice beaver, said Lucy. Yes, but how do we know, said Edmund. Shall we have to risk it, said Susan. I mean, it's no good just standing here and I feel I want some dinner. At this moment, the beaver again popped his head out from behind the tree and beckoned earnestly to them. Come on, said Peter, let's give it a try. All keep close together. We ought to be a match for one beaver if it turns out to be an enemy. <laughs> so the children all got closer together and walked up to the tree and in behind it. And there, sure enough, they found the beaver. But it still drew back, saying to them in a hoarse, throaty whisper, Further in, come further in, right in here. We're not safe in the open. Only when it had led them into a dark spot where four trees grew so close together that the boughs met and the brown earth and pine needles could be seen underfoot because no snow had been able to fall there did it begin to talk to them. 
are you the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve? It said. Well, there's some of them, said Peter. Shh, said the beaver. Not so loud, please. We're not safe even here. Well, why? Who are you so afraid of? said Peter. Well, there's no one here but ourselves. There are the trees, said the beaver. They're always listening. Most of them are on our side, but there are trees that will betray us to her. You know who I mean. And it nodded his head several times. If it comes to talking about sides, said Edmund, how do we know that you're a friend? Not meaning to be rude, Mr. Beaver, added Peter, but you see, we're strangers. In fact, oh, there's a picture of the beaver. Picture time! There we are. Isn't he cute? Right. Carry on. Um, we're strangers, said Peter. Quite right, quite right, said the beaver. Here is my token. With these words, it held up to them a little white object. They all looked at it in surprise, till Lucy, suddenly Lucy said, Oh, of course, it's my handkerchief, the one I gave to poor Tumnus. That's right, said the beaver. Poor fellow. He got, win got wind of the arrest before it actually happened and handed this over to me. He said that if anything happened to him, I must meet you here and take you on to... Here the beaver's voice sank into silence and it gave one or two very mysterious nods, then signalling to the children to stand as close around it as possible, they, as possibly they could, so their faces were actually tickled by its whiskers. It actually said, in a low whisper, They say Aslan is on the move. Perhaps it's already landed. And now, a very curious thing happened. None of the children knew who Aslan was any more than you do. Although I know some of you do. Yeah, you do. Hi, John. Yeah, hello. Right, sorry. Um, but the moment the beaver had spoken these words, everyone felt quite different. Perhaps it has some, sometimes happened to you in a dream that someone says something which you don't understand, but it, in a dream it feels as if it has some enormous meaning, either a terrifying one which turns the whole dream into a nightmare, or else a lovely meaning too, too lovely to put into words, which makes the dream so beautiful that you remember it all your life and are always wishing you could get into that dream again. It was like that now. At the name of Aslan, each one of the children felt something jump in its inside. Edmund felt a sensation of mysterious horror. Peter felt suddenly brave and adventurous. Susan felt as if some delicious smell or some delightful strain of music had just floated by her. And Lucy got the feeling you have when you wake up in the morning and realise that it's the beginning of the summer holidays. And what about Mr. Tumnus? said Lucy. Where is he? Shh! said the beaver. Not here. I must bring you where we can have a real talk, and also dinner. No one except Edmund felt any different about, felt, sorry, felt any difficulty about trusting the beaver now. And everyone, including Ever Edmund, was very glad to hear the word dinner. They therefore all hurried along behind their new friend, who led them at a surprisingly quick pace, and always in the thickest parts of the forest, for over an hour. Everyone was feeling very tired and very hungry when suddenly the trees began to get thinner, in front of them, and the ground to fall steeply downhill. A minute later, they came out under the open sky. The sun was still shining, and found themselves looking down on a fine sight. They were standing on the edge of a steep, narrow valley, at the bottom of which ran, at least it would have been running if it hadn't been frozen, a fairly large river. Just below them, a dam had been built across this river, and when they saw it, every, everyone suddenly remembered that, of course, beavers are always making dams, and felt... Let's wait for the siren. Thank you. It's good to know our emergency services are still on full whack. Good for them. God bless them. Let's carry on. Beavers are always making dams, and felt quite sure that Mr. Beaver had made this one. They also noticed that they were... They, that he had now a sort of modest expression on his face, the sort of look people have when you're visiting a garden they've made or reading a story they've written. So it was only common politeness when Susan said, What a lovely dam! And Mr. Beaver didn't say, Hush! But this time he said merely, Merely a trifle, merely a, a trifle. And it isn't really finished. Above the dam, there was what ought to have been a deep pool, but was now, of course, a level floor of dark green ice. 
and below the dam, much lower down, was more ice, but instead of being smooth, this was all frozen into the foamy and wavy shapes in which the water had been rushing along at the very moment when the frost came. And where the water had been trickling over and spurting through the dam, there was now a glittering wall of icicles, as if the side of the dam had been covered all over with flowers and wreaths and festoons of the purest sugar. And out in the middle, and partly on top of the dam, was a funny little house, shaped rather like an enormous beehive. And from a hole in the roof, smoke was going up. So that when you saw it, especially if you were hungry, you were once sort of cooking and became hungrier than you were before. That was what the others chiefly noticed. But Edmund noticed something else. A little lower down the river there was another small river, which came down another small valley to join it. And looking up that valley, Edmund could see two small hills. And he was almost sure that they were the two hills which the White Witch had pointed out to him when he parted from her at the lamppost that other day. And then between them, he thought, must be her palace. Only a mile off or less. And he thought about Turkish delight and about being a king. Oh, I wonder how Peter would like that, he asked himself. He's not Cockney, sorry. I wonder how Peter would like that. I'm doing a Cockney, help! I wonder how... I wonder how Peter would like that, he asked himself. And horrible ideas came into his head. I can't not do Cockney now. I've destroyed myself. Here we are then, said Mr Beaver. I'm allowed to do Cockney for him. It looks as if Mrs Beaver is expecting us. I'll lead the way, but be careful. Don't, don't, don't slip. Oh, there's a picture. Go on, I'll show you a picture. Here we are. Here's a picture. <gasps> Such a fun ac accent to do is Cockney. Right. The top of the dam was wide enough to walk on, though not for humans a very nice place to walk because it was covered with ice. And though the, fro the frozen pool was level, it on one level with it on one side, there was a nasty drop to the other side. To the, to the lower river on the other side. Along this route, Mr. Beaver led them in a single file right out to the middle where they could look a long way up the river and a long way down it. And when they reached the middle, they were at the door of the house. Here we are, Mrs. Beaver, said Mr. Beaver. I found them. Here are the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. And they all went in. The first thing Lucy noticed as she went in was a burring sound. And the first thing she saw was a kind-looking old she-beaver she sitting in the corner with a thread in her mouth, working busily at her sewing machine. And it was from it that the sound came. Burr. I've never heard of that in my life, a burring sound. She stopped her work and got up as soon as the children came in. So you've come at last, she said, holding out both her wrinkled old paws. At last, to think that ever I should live to see this day. The potatoes are boiling and the kettle's singing, and I dare say, Mr. Beaver, you'll get us some fish. That I will, said Mr. Beaver, and he went out, out of the house. Peter went with him, and across the ice of the deep pool to where he had a little hole in the ice, which he kept open every day with his hatchet. They took a pail with them. Mr. Beaver sat quietly down on the edge of the hole. He didn't seem to mind it being so chilly. Looked hard into it, then suddenly shot in his paw, and before you could say Jack Robinson, he had whisked out a beautiful trout. Then he did it all over again until they had a fine catch of fish. Meanwhile, the girls were helping Mrs. Beaver to fill the kettle and lay the table and cut the bread and put the plates in the oven and heat and draw uh, to heat and draw a huge jug of beer for Mr. Beaver from a barrel which stood in one corner of the house and to put on the frying pan and to get the dripping hot. Mmm, dripping. <laughs> for those of you who don't know what dripping is, it's basically animal fat. <clears throat> Lucy thought the beavers had a very snug little home, though it was not at all like Mr. Thomas's cave. There were no books or pictures, and instead of beds, there were bunks, like on board a ship, built into the wall. Oh, is there, there's a picture of Mrs. Beaver. Here we are. <laughs> oh, it's a very happy book, this. There she is. Yep. Right. And there were hams and strings of onions hanging from the roof, and against the walls were gumboots and oil skins and hatchets and pairs of shears, and spades, and trowels, and things for carrying mortar in, and fishing rods, and fishing nets, and sacks, and the cloth on the table, though very clean, was very rough. Just as the frying pan was nicely hissing, Peter and Mr. Beaver came in with the fish, 
which Mr. Beaver had already opened with his knife and cleaned out in the open air. You can think how good the new caught fish smelled while they were frying, and how the hungry children longed for them to be done, and how very much hungrier still they had become before Mr. Beaver said, Ah, we're nearly ready. Susan drained the potatoes and then put them all back in the empty pot to dry on the side of the range while Lucy was helping. Sorry, while Lucy was helping Mrs. Beaver to dish up the trout, so that in a very few minutes everyone was drawing up their stools. It was all three-legged stools in the Beaver's house, except for Mrs. Beaver's own special rocking chair besides the fire, and preparing to enjoy themselves. There was a jug of creamy milk for the children, Mr. Beaver stuck to his beer, and a great big lump of deep yellow butter in the middle of the table from which everyone took as much as he wanted to go with his potatoes. And all the children thought, and I agree with them, said Mr. C.S. Lewis, that there's nothing to beat good freshwater fish if you eat it when it's just been alive half an hour ago and has come out of the pan half a minute ago. I'll show you a picture of all them eating together. Nice. Can you see? Yes. Sorry if it's a bit fuzzy. Oh, I want trout for dinner now. Never had trout in my life. Anyway. Right. And when they'd finished the fish, Mrs. Beaver bought unexpectedly out of the oven a great and gloriously sticky marmalade roll, steaming hot, and at the same time moved the kettle onto the fire so that when they finished the marmalade roll, the tea was made and ready to be poured out. And when each person had got his or her cup of tea, each person shoved back his or her stool so as to be able to lean against a wall and give a long sigh of contentment. <sighs> Although I, I would have the tea with the cake, obviously. And now, said Mr. Beaver, pushing away his empty beer mug and pulling his cup of tea towards him, if you'll just wait till I've got my pipe lit and going nicely, why, now we can get to business. It's snowing again, he added, cocking his eye at the window. It's all the better, because it means we shan't have any visitors. And if anyone should have been trying to follow you, why, they won't find any tracks. I swear the accent almost went slightly Australian then. Anyway, chapter eight. What happened after dinner? And now, said Lucy, do please tell us what's happened to Mr. Tumnus. Ah, that's bad, said Mr. Beaver, shaking his head. Yes, sir, that's a very bad business. Very bad business. There's no doubt he was taken off by the police. I got that from a bird who saw it done. But where's he been taken to? Asked Lucy. Well, they were heading northwards when they were last seen. And we all know what that means, don't we? No, we don't, says Susan. We don't. Mr Beaver shook his head in a very gloomy fashion. I'm afraid it means they were taken into her house, he said. But what, are they, what will they do to him, Mr. Beaver? gasped Lucy. Well, said Mr. Beaver, you can't exactly say for sure. There's not many taken in there that ever comes out again. Statues. All full of statues, they say it is. In the courtyard and up the stairs and in the hall. People she's turned. He paused and shuddered. Ugh. Turned to stone. But Mr. Beaver, said Lucy, can't we... I mean, we must do something to save him. It's too dreadful, and it's all on my account. I don't doubt you'd save him if you could, dearie, said Mrs. Beaver. But you've no chance of getting into that house against her will, and ever coming out alive. Um, couldn't we have some stratagem, said Peter. I mean, couldn't we dress up as something, or pretend to be, oh, peddlers or anything, or, or watch till she's gone out, or, or, oh, hang it all, there must be some way. This fawn, he saved my sister at his own risk, Mr. Beaver. We can't just leave him to be, to be, to have that done to him. It's no good, son of Adam. No good, said Mr. Beaver. No good you're trying, of all people. But now that Aslan is on the move. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Tell us more about Aslan, said several other people. several other voices at once, for once again that strange feeling like the first signs of spring, like good news, had come over them. Who is Aslan? asked Susan. Aslan? said Mr Beaver. Why, don't you know? He's the king. He's the lord of the whole wood. But not often here, you understand. Never in my time or, or my father's time. 
But the word has reached us that he's come back. He is in Narnia at this moment. Oh, he'll settle the White Queen all right. Oh, yes, it is he, not you, who will save Mr. Tumnus. She won't turn him into stone too, said Edmund. Lord love you, son of Adam. What a simple thing to say, answered Mr. Beaver with a great laugh. Turn him into stone? Ha <laughs> ha! If, you know, if she can stand on her two feet and look him in his face, it'll be the most she can do, and more than I expect of her. No, 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 no. He'll put all to rights, as it says in the old rhyme in these parts. Ahem. Wrong will be right when Aslan comes in sight. At the sound of his roar, sorrows will be no more. When he bears his teeth, winter meets its death. Death. Yeah. And when he shakes his mane, we shall have spring again. You'll understand when you see him. But shall we see him? asked Susan. Why, daughter of Eve, that's what I brought you here for. I'm to lead you to where you shall meet him, said Mr. Beaver. Is, is he a man? asked Lucy. Aslan, a man? said Mr. Beaver sternly. Certainly not. Hmm, I'll tell you, he's the king of the wood and the son of the great emperor beyond the sea. Don't you know who the king of beasts is? Eh? Aslan is a lion. The lion. The great lion. Ooh, said Susan. I thought he did. I thought he was a man. Is he, is he quite safe? I should feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and make no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear, appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most. Or else just silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. I'm longing to see him, said Peter, even if I do feel frightened when it comes to the point. That's right, son of Adam, said Mr. Beaver bashing his paws down on the table with a crash that made all the cups and saucers rattle. And so you shall! Word has been sent that you are to meet him tomorrow, if you can, at the stone table. Yeah. Where's that? asked Lucy. I'll show you, said Mr. Beaver. It's down the river a good step from here. I'll take you to it. But meanwhile, uh, what about poor Tumnus? Hmm? said Lucy. The quickest way you can help him is by going to meet Aslan, said Mr. Beaver. Once he's with us, then we can begin doing things. Now that we don't need you to, for that's another of the old rhymes here. When Adam's flesh and Adam's bone sits at Care Paravel in throne, the evil time will be over and done. Done. Old-fashioned rhymes don't always rhyme every word. They rhyme the language. The, yeah. You know what I mean. <sighs> so... Things must be drawing near their end now he's come and you've come. Yeah. We've heard of Aslan coming into these parts before. Long ago. Nobody can say when. But there's never been any of your race here before. And that's what I don't understand, Mr. Beaver, said Peter. I mean, isn't the witch herself human? Oh, she'd like to believe she'd like us to believe it, said Mr. Beaver. And it's on that she bases her claim to be the queen, but she's no daughter of Eve. No. She comes at your father Adam's, here Mr. Beaver bowed, your father Adam's first wife. Her they called Lilith, and she was one of the jinn. Yeah, that's what she comes from, on one side, and on the other side she comes from the giants. No, no, there isn't a drop of real human blood in the witch. That's why she's bad all through, Mr. Beaver, said Mrs. Beaver. True enough, Mrs. Beaver, replied he. There may be two views about humans meaning no offence to the present company, but there's no two views about things that look like humans and ain't. Hmm. I've known, I've known good dwarves, said Mrs. Beaver. So have I, now you come to speak of it, said her husband. But precious few, and they were the ones least like men. But in general, take my advice, when you meet anything that's going to be human and isn't yet, or used to be human once and isn't now, or ought to be human, and isn't. You keep your eyes on it and feel for your hatchet. The hatchet is an axe, just so that you know. 
And that's why the witch is always on the lookout for any humans in Narnia. She's been watching for you this many a year. Oh, I tell you. And if she knew there were four of you, she'd be more dangerous still. What's that got to do with it? Asked Peter. Because of another prophecy, said Mr. Beaver. Down at Care Paravel. Oh, that's the castle on the sea, on the sea coast, down at the mouth of this river, which ought to be the capital of the whole country, if all was as it should be. Down at Care Paravel, there are four thrones. And it's a saying in Narnia that out of mind, so in Narnia time, out of mind, that when two sons of Adam and two daughters of Eve sit on those four thrones, then it'll be the end. Not only of the white witch's reign, but of her life. And that's why we had to be so cautious as you came along. Hmm. For if she knew about you four, ooh, your lives wouldn't be worth a shake of my whiskers. All the children had been attending so hard to what Mr. Beaver was telling them that they'd noticed nothing else for a long time. Then, during the moment of silence that followed this last remark, Lucy suddenly said, I say, where's Edmund? There was a dreadful pause. And then everyone began asking, who saw, who saw him last? Uh, how long has he been missing? Is he outside? And then all rushed to the door and looked out. The snow was falling thickly and steadily. The green ice of the pool had vanished under a thick white blanket. And from where the little house stood in the centre of the dam, you could hardly see either bank. Out they went, plunging well over their ankles into the soft new snow, and went round the house in every direction. Edmund! Edmund! They called, till they were hoarse. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. But they suddenly, but the, the silently falling snow seemed to muffle their voices, and there was not even an echo in his answer. In in an answer. Here you go. There's a picture of them in the snow. Edmund, where are you? Right. Oh, how perfectly dreadful! Said Susan, as they at last came back in despair. Oh, I wish it never come. I oh, know. Sorry, I wish we'd never come. What on, earth, what on earth do we do, Mr. Beaver? said Peter. Do? said Mr. Beaver, who was already putting on his snow boots. Do? We must be off at once. We haven't a moment to spare. Mm, we better divide into four search parties, said Peter, and all go in different directions. Whoever find him must come back here at once, and... Search parties, son of Adam? said Mr. Beaver. What for? Why, to, to look for Edmund, of course. There's no point in looking for him, said Mr. Beaver. What do you mean? said Susan. He can't be that far away yet, and we've got to find him. What do you mean when you say there's no use looking for him? The reason there's no use looking for him, said Mr. Beaver, is that we already know where he's gone. Everyone stared in amazement. Don't you understand, said Mr. Beaver, he's gone to her, to the, to the White Witch. He's betrayed us all. Oh, surely. Oh, really, said Susan. He can't have done that. Can't he? said Mr. Beaver, looking very hard at the three children, and everything they wanted to say died on the lips, for each felt suddenly quite certain inside that this was exactly what Edmund had done. But will he know the way? said Peter. Has he been in this country before? said Mr. Beaver. Has he ever been here alone? Yes, said Lucy, almost in a whisper. I'm afraid he has. And did he tell you what he'd done here, or who he'd met? Oh, no, he didn't, said Lucy. Then mark my words, said Mr. Beaver. He's already met the White Witch, and joined her side, and been told where she lives. I didn't like to mention it before, you, he being your brother and all of that. But the moment I set eyes on him, and that brother of yours, I said to myself, Treacherous! That's what I said. Treacherous! He had the look of one of those who's been with a witch, and eaten her food. Yeah, you can always tell him if you live long in Narnia. Something about the eyes, yeah. All the same, said Peter in a rather choking sort of voice. We still have to go and look for him. He is our brother after all. Even if he is a rather little beast. And he's only a kid. Go to the witch's house, said Mrs. Beaver. Don't you see that the only chance of saving either him or yourselves is to keep away from her? How do you mean, said Lucy. Why, all she wants is to get all four of you. She's thinking all the time of those four thrones at Care Paravel. Once you were all four inside her house, her job will be done. And there'd be four new statues in her collection before her time, your time had come to speak. 
but she'll keep him alive as long as he's the only one she's got because she wants to use him as a decoy as bait to catch the rest of you oh no can no one help us wailed lucy only aslan said mr beaver we must go on and meet him that's our only chance now nah. it seems to me my dears said mrs beaver that it is very important to know just when he slipped away how much he can tell her depends on how much he heard for instance had he had we started speaking about aslan before he left if not then we we may do very well for she won't know that aslan has come into narnia and that we're meeting him and will be quite off her guard as far as that is concerned no i i don't remember him being here when we were talking about aslan began peter but lucy interrupted him oh yes he was said she miserably don't you remember it was he who asked whether the witch could turn aslan into stone too ah so he did by jove said peter just the sort of thing he'd say too oh worse and worse said mr beaver and the next thing is this was he still here when i told you that the place for the meeting of aslan was to be the stone table eh? was he here then and of course no one knew the answer to this question because if he was said mr beaver then she'll simply sledge down in that direction and get between us and the stone table and catch us on our, on our way down. In fact, we shall be cut off from Aslan. But that isn't what she'll do first, said Mrs. Beaver. The moment that Esmond, Edmund tells we're all here, she'll set out to catch us this very night. If, she's been if he's been gone about half an hour, then she'll be here in about another twenty. Twenty minutes. You're right, Mrs. Beaver said Mr. Beaver. We must all get away from here. There's not a moment to lose. To the feet. So that wasn't in the book. Yeah. Let's get out of here, he said. And that is the end of the chapter. End of chapter eight. Find out tomorrow night what happens in chapter nine. Do they get out alive? Will the white witch catch them and eat them? Or just turn them into stone? I'm just making things up now. Find out in tomorrow's episode of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. Read by... An out-of-work actor who is really overacting all of these characters and who can't keep a Cockney accent down for more than half an hour. <laughs> right. <sighs> Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed yourselves. I enjoyed that. Good grief. I shall have some more characters and some more accents tomorrow for you. Have a good night. God bless you all. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Stay positive. And I'll see you tomorrow at half past five for the last of this week's instalments until next week. Right. Have a good evening. Goodbye, all of you. Goodbye.